All right. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're very welcome to uh, uh, an auspicious occasion. Um, uh, we have Derek Sweetman's uh, de defense of his dissertation uh, today, and um, we have the committee here, which uh, is composed of uh, Professor Sarah Cobb, who is um, coming in electronically from uh, Massachusetts, and uh, Professor John Dale uh, from uh, the main campus, and I'm very, very grateful for his participation. Um, and, uh, and I'm uh, Richard Rubenstein. We have uh, Derek uh, is going to make a presentation, and um, after which the committee will ask him questions. People in the room who would like to ask questions are invited to do that. Uh, then we will withdraw and consider the situation and come back and report. Um, but uh, the main thing I wanted to do is to welcome Derek here, who's done a, an important piece of work, I think. And um, uh, Derek Sweetman graduated from uh, Longmont High School in uh, Longmont, Colorado, where my grandchildren live. <laughs> uh, got a Bachelor of Arts from Colorado State in uh, 1997 and a master's in conflict analysis and resolution from uh, this institution uh, in 2007. Uh, Derek has been employed by the Better Business Bureau in Washington for a number of years and um, has uh, taught at George Mason since uh, 2009. Uh, a number of courses, um, some of which I'm very familiar with and uh, is a one, actually a wonderful teacher, as well as a very fine writer. So we're very happy to have you here and uh, to celebrate this achievement of yours, Derek. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so the floor is yours. We'll go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, before I get started, um, I want to thank my wife and daughter for coming. Uh, my wife is uh, playing hooky from work today so that she could come, and my daughter is giving her second to last day of summer up to be in Arlington, and all I had to do was promise her dinner. So I think it was actually quite nice of her. Um, as my title slide indicates, the title of my project is Let Us Boldly Explode It, Repetitions of American Piecework. You'll actually understand why I chose that particular quote as we move along. Um, Rich has done a great job of introducing the committee. I do want to give you an idea of the plan for my presentation today. There are a number of steps through which I went as I, as I developed this project, as I went through the writing process, and I've broken it down into formulating the question, to devising the approach that I use, and then reporting back on the four problem orientations that I identify, which is a term that will make a lot more sense in a couple minutes. Um, I had to cut down a lot, of course, you always do for this, and so unfortunately I've removed anything entertaining from the dissertation, and we're just left with the stuff I can do in 30, sec 30 minutes. 30 seconds would be nice, but that's it. So in formulating the question, always the first step of really any research project, I began thinking about this in a, in a weird way as early as 2003. This is a photo from the New York protest on February 15th of 2003 against the Iraq war. I remember, um, being an SCAR student at the time, working downtown um, and, and seeing the actions that were going on and hearing about it and feeling, I, all I could say was quite odd as a result um, because I felt both very hopeful for what I was seeing in the streets and entirely pessimistic about what was there. And actually, um, L.A. Kaufman, uh, put this together, and I'll get to her in just a second. But I do want to point out that those were the largest protests in human history. 36 million people protested the Iraq War in the streets around the world between January and April of 2003. And as you'll note, they prevented zero wars, which is not a very good ratio. What L.A. Kaufman said to kind of capture this, and this is writing in direct action just a couple of years ago, really resonated with me as a description of how it felt to be thinking about this field at this time, thinking about politics at this time. And she said, there was something uniquely dispiriting about having organized the largest display of dissent in world history only to have it ignored. 
And I started from the position of saying, well, how can you get there? How can you get to a point where basically all of this work for peace ultimately means nothing? And I thought about it for a while, but I realized that I wasn't as interested in answering that question just about the Iraq war in 2003. It's somewhat interesting to talk about action against a single war. It's a little more interesting if you talk about a, a short-lived campaign, like the student peace campaign in the 30s. For me, it was even more interesting to think about something like the arbitration campaign, which went on for more than 100 years. And ultimately, I settled on the fact that I was interested not in why we could not prevent the Iraq war, for which I think there are very good reasons, but why Americans who have contributed so much to the skills, to the ideas, to the principles of peace work and peace building have been unable to stop the country from becoming a country that has been the largest military for the last, say, 50 years and has been the most bellicose over the last 200 years. The United States has participated in more military actions than any other country over that time. And that tension really led me to question what's limiting American peace work, which is a decent attempt to conceptualize what I wanted to do from the start. From there, I needed to develop a particular approach because grabbing onto a 225-year enterprise is not something you can do with a lot of tools that are hang just hanging around. So I started by narrowing a couple of concepts that would let me identify exactly what object I was looking at. The first of these was the notion of intervention, which I'm borrowing straight from conflict analysis and resolution and, you, and treating quite the same way. For me, an intervention is an attempt by someone to reach into a situation, into a system to make a difference. Right? It's, it, it's relatively straightforward, but it also helps us ground what we're doing in the work that is done instead of doing, for example, intellectual history or ideational history or organizational history. To look at the times when people have actually tried to influence the ability to make war or the choice to make war. I then expanded this to a notion of piecework. And for me, piecework is the collection of all interventions that are about peace. Right? This is strictly a definitional idea, but it allows you to now speak of this in the entirety and say that there's something called piecework that is done at different times in different places. The third step then becomes talking about American piecework specifically. And although I think it would be very interesting to look at what I looked at in a lot of other settings, I quite consciously limited myself to what I call American piecework, being piecework that happens in the United States or at least intending to target the United States. Of course, the vast majority of that ends up being by people who live here you know, against the government that's there. This isn't to deny the importance of looking at transnational movements or the ways in which ideas and tactics have been shared, but to see if approaching it this way would allow me to say something intelligent and interesting about the process and gain some insight into what was going on. So, after that point, I needed to start talking about identifying text. I had an idea of what the scope of my object was, but not literally what made it up. Uh, I should say, quite from the start, I'm defining text very broadly in a good cultural studies transition where a text is anything that you can read. And I'm focusing on the things that were done. So what that does is it, it creates two interesting changes to the way you normally do research. The first is I had to recognize that text can be both primary and secondary sources at the same time. That when Merle Curti writes about the American peace movement in 1935, he's doing secondary analysis, and presenting secondary information about the people who were working before him, but does that in almost every case specifically to influence the debate of what's going on in an attempt to influence Piecework and actually as an act of piecework. So to a large extent, the texts I relied on were either primary or contemporary accounts of actions that had been taking place, or they were secondary texts that were also considered as primary texts at a different time in a different location. 
Um, I did mention also, I, I already threw this in, but that I'm looking at both, as much as possible, contemporary accounts of the actions, primary. I stayed away to a large extent from trying to understand the piecework of 200 years ago through histories of today. Um, for reasons I'll get into in a minute, but it was better for me to be able to go back and read what the people said, read what the people did, how they reported out to know what was going on. I had some initial observations about this object as I started digging into it, and, and digging into it really was starting to read. This, this was a get a big pile of information kind of project for me. The first was that there were an amazing amount of repetitions and rediscoveries in piecework in the United States. You saw a number of instances where something would pop up, disappear, it would pop up somewhere else with someone else who has no connection to the original action. Ideas were being, I use the term rediscovered instead of recycled because it was almost as if looking at the same situation, we found instances that were, were almost uncanny. And I've got two examples to, kind of, to, to make this clear. Um, one is the notion of positive and negative peace, which probably isn't an intervention on American peace work because we attribute it to Johann Galtung, and uh, although he does a lot of work over here, I believe he was in Europe at the time. But it's taught to us in Conflict Analysis and Resolution as a, as a new idea that pops up somewhere in the mid-60s between a couple of articles. We definitely credit to him. We put it in the textbooks. And when I started looking back, I found this same distinction was being made by a number of different individuals. And I trace the idea back at least as far as 1783 in the American context. There's a book that summarizes English common law called Matthew Bacon's New Abridgment of the Law from 1793. And it separates peace into both what we call positive peace now and such peace as is only a negation or absence of war which is very, very close to what we get to from Galton. Now, I don't point this out because I want to indict Dr. Galton's ability to cite his sources. I don't think he knew about these books. He definitely didn't have access to them. I was greatly assisted by being able to search some large corpuses to get there. But it wasn't the only instance of this. Another one that I came across after I had formulated this as, a, as a, something to look at was in The Friend of Peace. So there's a man named Noah Worcester. He started The Friend of Peace, which was a magazine about peace ideas that extends off from the Massachusetts Peace Society. Kicks off in, I believe, um, 1815, runs for about 30 years. And his career in the peace movement, if you want to think about it that way, started when he published a, a tract or a pamphlet called The Solemn Review of the Custom of Peace. He published this, it was very popular, a lot of other people started saying, wow, those are great ideas, we should work together, and then he republished it in the first issue of The Friend of Peace. In about the third issue of The Friend of Peace, he got a letter from somebody saying, it's great that you're such a fan of Erasmus. Uh, to which Noah Wooster said, I've heard of Erasmus, what are you talking about? And went off and dug up the books, I believe The Complaint of Peace, which is uh, from 1521, and the ideas are remarkably similar. And again, I don't have any reason to believe that Wooster was trying to pass off uh, Erasmus's work as his own, I take him at his belief, but instead that it's a pattern that you see in piecework when you look at it over this large scale. You see things arising in areas you don't expect them that have resonances, strong resonances with other parts, and you find people who seem to spend a lot of time rediscovering what was discovered before. I've thought about this actually specifically as a long connection of beginnings. It's one thing that I, I, I'll get to, well, in the suspicions of history, I can actually talk about this. Um, I don't believe it's wise to talk about what a lot of scholars claim is the American peace movement in a very linear, progressive fashion. We started a country, got a peace movement, things got better, and then, well, look around. Um, <laughs> we, we definitely can't tell that story. I think that may be a way of framing narratives about social movements in some cases. I think it, it is instructive to talk about the movement for the abolition of slavery or the movement for civil rights or women's rights as having a beginning, a middle, and some kind of at least a temporary end. Now, 
Um, those movements are not movements that have been 100% successful, and I'm not trying to claim that, but they're movements that seem to fall into that type of description much better. And ultimately, I end up arguing that those may just be something different fundamentally as we move along. So it helped me create a, a strong belief or suspicion in the nature of the way we do history on peace movements. Um, when you tell a history, you're doing a couple of things. The first is you're providing interpretation about the world, right? There's a reason the history department sits over in the humanities and not in the sciences. And that act is one that, as we all know, is always going to be political, will either support or oppose dominant forces and all of that. But another thing that history does is it tends to make our narratives much more closed, to seem like, because I could tell a story about a particular place at a particular time, I can tell the story. And the time I started the story and the time I ended the story are the important times. Along with this, I recognize that the act of history primarily as a writer is about implotment. You look at everything that happened, you decide how to present it, you decide in what order to present it. You can't do anything you want, right? It's hard to say 1649 came before 1639, but ultimately you're making a lot of choices. And those choices, I feel, can pull you away from an understanding of the challenges and of the good work that's being done in this particular case. I also recognized relatively quickly that there was a lot of different piece work that seemed to naturally fall into four categories that I end up labeling problem orientations. I'll talk about a lot more uh, as we go along. But the basic idea here is that it became very useful for me to, out of all the pile of information I had on the floor, metaphorically and literally in some cases, um, that we could start dividing them between how they approach the nature of change required for the piece work to be successful. So this was an assumption that was on one hand made by the people who were doing the piece work, but more importantly that you can see in looking at the literal work. You can see how the machine is supposed to function. And so these problem orientations helped me get a better idea of how to continue working through this material. Now at that po point, I needed some kind of a theoretical structure to hang this on because again, you can't just present a pile of information as a dissertation, even if it seems like I've tried. Um, what really jumped out for me was the approach to losing Atari put together, the French theorists from uh, writing, in this case in the early 70s, um, about rhizomatic thought and rhizomatic action. Um, I don't incorporate the wide range of their approaches as much as I borrow this idea. Um, so I don't ultimately come to any conclusions about the appropriateness of Deleuze Guitar to explain the world or anything like that. But I found that the idea of the rhizome became very important for me to be able to understand what was going on, what I was seeing, and ultimately how to then present it, which was its own challenge. So for Deleuze and Guattari, they look at the world and they say that, especially in the Western context, we tend to like to structure things aborescently in trees, right? Everyone's been to a conflict resolution training with a tree metaphor, I'm sure of it, even if you're not in the program. The tree approach always wants to talk about roots and trunks and stems and branches and things moving in one direction from the core from the root cause, right, as, as we'll often say it, and then expanding out, but doing so in ways that are siloed, that are understandable, that can be explained and can be recognized. And Deleuze and Guattari argue that by and large, that's not a useful way to describe contemporary society. And I think also by and large, not a useful way to talk about something like American peace work. Instead, they look to the rhizome. A rhizome is a metaphor, that's stolen from biology. Um, they do a, a pretty good job of trying not to let the metaphor drive the analysis, although that's always a danger when you, when you adopt biological metaphors. In biology, a rhizome is a plant that grows by extending the stem horizontally under the ground. And at different points, it will send off shoots, it will send off roots, it may have fruits, but ultimately the rhizome itself can replicate what it needs when it needs it and can do this over a large scale. I've got a 
graphic representation that was done by um, an artist a couple of years ago of a mushroom rhizome that um, I don't think physically could work in the world. But you have the same idea back here that everything is connected, everything is related, but it doesn't happen along pre-established channels of meaning, pre-established channels of, of physical location. If there's a break in the rhizome, it can work around it. If there's the possibility that, that it can expand, that it can, it can use the resources it has, it will take that. Uh, the world's largest organism is a rhizome, a fungus in Oregon that's 10 square miles or something like that. But rhizome for them becomes a founding metaphor for a different way of thinking that stresses a lot of things that you will find in other theorists as well. Non-linearity, the possibility of rebirth, the importance of looking at disruption, repetition, and difference as things move along. So I adopt the rhizome and try and use the rhizome as a way to both understand and describe American piecework through the lens of these, through the lens of the rhizome. I have totally twisted myself into my own rhizome. Now, just so you're clear, Deleuze and, and Guattari say the rhizome is a finite network of automata in which communication runs from any neighborhood to any other. The stems or channels do not pre-exist and all individuals are interchangeable, defined only by their state at a given moment, such that the local operations are coordinated and the final global result synchronized without a central agency. I actually agree with all of that. I, I wish they'd found a better way of, of explaining it that I could have stolen. But we're talking about a system that doesn't have a preordained structure, but does have a form that you can look at through relationships and that you can use to make something progress as you're going along. Well, the problem with adopting a rhizome is when you go to present your data, if you put it back into an aborescent form, it's very difficult to both convince your reader that a rhizomatic approach makes sense and also to even make it fit. You know, it's one thing to say life is nonlinear, but it's another to either tell this is a historic chronological story or go too far the other way and give your give your your committee, I don't know, a stack of pages and tell them they should start reading wherever they want. Um, I didn't get that far, I didn't try that. Um, so I tried to find ways that I could present this material that I felt was true to the rhizome while still being understandable. Because ultimately the goal, especially in complex analysis and resolution, is to make a difference in the world. That we're trying to be able to influence. And I don't feel that this was entirely successful. And I'll talk to this at the, at the end, but it was, this was the thought process behind what I was doing. Um, I, I looked at these four problems to describe the problems and the nature of the problems, the problem orientations, I looked at the ways they were divided, other logical divisions that popped up. I made sure that when I was giving examples, they were from varied sources and varied times. They were not presented chronologically. Um, I, in the case of writing, grabbed onto songs. That's a very good way of explaining this because there are a lot of songs that have been used in piecework and songs gave me small snippets that worked well there. If I was doing this as a full-fledged presentation, I'd probably move to visual media. There are a lot of different ways of presenting this, but that was the one that seemed to work the best and most reliably as I went through, um, along with whatever other examples I could find. You also want to make sure that you include, in rhizomatic work, according to Luz Gnatari, humor and play. Um, so I tried to make parts of the dissertation, dissertation moderately entertaining even um, by, if, if I was faced with, Two, two options for an example. I picked the funny one. Um, the point of this is to destabilize the relationship of the reader to the text, not to the purpose, to the point that they remove any belief in what's going on, but so they don't absorb it through that kind of linear response. And I think it's really up to my committee to let me know if any of that worked, um, because as the author, who knows? Um, beyond the divisions, I also flesh out the notion of these problem orientations by looking at projects, at campaigns, and then some concerns. Projects were just instances where people worked 
on the same issue in roughly the same way over an amount of time. Campaigns were those that were more organized where everyone involved or almost everyone involved understood they were working together and often referred to things as working together. And the concerns were, were an opportunity for me to talk through, well, if piecework is structured in this particular way, what can come from that? For the presentation today, because I don't have a lot of time, I'll primarily just focus on the divisions within the problems. Now, the first problem that I discuss is what I call the problem of exposure. And this is made up of interventions that are structured around the idea that we just need to get people to see. We just need to get people to realize. We just need to people, get people exposed to whatever the idea is. Um, Edwin Starr's War is a great example of this. This is the song that goes, war, huh, yeah. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Say it again. The point of the song, seen as an element of peace work, is, hey, once you sing along and realize this, we're done. And the problem of exposure really works under that logic. Now, of course, the artists involved, the writers involved, don't believe that you can change everyone's mind with a single song or with a single page or a single novel. But they all look for what, in conflict resolution, we would call an insight process. They're looking for that flash where somebody goes from being a war supporter to a peace supporter as it goes along. So when you look at the problem of exposure, you notice that there are really just a few different ways that things are done. One group looks at representations that say people need to see that war is bad, right? Bad for a lot of reasons. There are a number of these that focus specifically on women, children, and families. There's some that focus on soldiers. There's some that focus um, on our victims. I was actually surprised to find as much work on problems that were occurring as a result of US military action in other countries. Um, some people argue it's bad for America. It's, it's either un-American or it degrades democracy, something like that. Especially early on, you saw many interventions talking about it being bad for Christians or Christianity. Noah Wooster, who's the one I discussed a little while ago, is an example of this. He really wanted to make the point that having um, war was an unchristian act, and they thought that they could, by convincing people of this, convince enough of the Christians in America, and therefore enough of America to make a difference. And finally, the people arguing that it was bad for the planet. Now, don't assume that this is actually an environmental concern. Um, there's a little bit of that kind of work, but really, the people who were arguing bad for the planet were talking ultimately about the destruction of everything. You see a lot of this in discussions of nuclear war, nuclear winter, and those actions as you go along. Now, there's another branch of this where they say, well, what it is is that people just can't see what they need to see. If they could see the truth, then everything would work. So sometimes the interventions are about breaking the fog of war, about trying to reveal what's actually going on. Sometimes the interventions are about helping people realize that war is absurd. A lot of the literature that we classify as anti-war, and you think of Dr. Strangelover, you think of Catch-22, that is very popular in the US, takes this form. And the last form of this is that war is not in their interests. And there are a number of different ways in which this is argued. Sometimes it's the, it's the government's war, right? That's just what the government wants to do. You shouldn't be involved in it. Sometimes it's the rich man's war, the elites versus everyone else who has to do the fighting. Sometimes it's specifically the boss's war, which is a, a, an approach that gets picked up along with the development of socialism and anarchism in the US. And you also have the white man's war, where the argument is made that members of racial minorities should stop participating, should not help, because it is not in their interests. I also mention the fact that it's a little odd that there isn't a man's war response to this. There are very few interventions that use this logic from a feminist perspective. I think largely because war is such a gendered activity that once people get into that research and that practice, they end up moving into other problem areas. There are also those that say we need to see alternatives. People need to be able to envision a changed world. I put up an example of Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward, 2000 to 1887, um, where he envisions the world as it was different and then just explains, well, of course it got this way. We solved all these problems like war and labor and everything else. There's also a surprisingly large amount of talk about how peace workers can be better messengers. Now, this shouldn't be any surprise 
for those of us now because there's a lot of that material. But going back even to the very first peace workers in the US, there were discussions about how do you give a good speech? How do you get the message across? What metaphors should you use? What stories should you use that carries through? There's even a point where Noah Wooster gives you a list of toasts that are appropriate and good for peace toasts that you should give after dinner. The second large problem area that I'm talking about is the problem of knowledge. And this is radically different because it doesn't presume that the problem is that people are not aware, but it instead assumes the problem is that we do not know something. Here we can borrow from Marvin Gaye. We don't need to escalate. You see, war is not the answer, for only love can conquer hate. You know we've got to find a way to bring some love in here today. So the problem of knowledge says there's something that we don't know that's keeping us from being able to do this. And in practice, the interventions take really two forms. One is about trying to shape where people look for these answers, and one is about shaping what questions get asked. Um, especially early on, people were saying, no, you need to look to the Quakers, you need to look to the Shakers, you need to look to the Mennonites, um, especially peace churches, you need to look to the life of Jesus. They also would say, you need to look at great thinkers, we need to examine the ideas of the past. And this is true also um, if you look at, say, Jane Addams' relationship with Tolstoy and the ideas that get brought over by pointing to the great man or later peace workers you know, calling to Gandhi or going back and calling to somebody like Thoreau. A number of them also point to indigenous ideas. We should look at the way the Native Americans do this. The Iroquois Confederacy comes up again and again and again and talks about a Congress of Nations. And finally, you get people saying we need to look to science. If we look at science, we can answer these problems. Now, the questions themselves are a little more direct and definitely feel a lot more comfortable to those of us in conflict analysis and resolution. We ask questions like, why does war happen? What is happening when America makes war? What alternatives can we create? And how can we get there from here? But the important thing is that we realize that all of these assume that we don't know. And if we could just find out, everything else would work. The problem of behavior is simply that we can get people to act differently. Sir Lancelot from 1946, I learned a lot about calypso music in this process, um, gave us an example here. For it's as simple as one and one makes two, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. It's the only way that wars will cease and men of goodwill shall walk in peace. Now the way it looks to me, it's a case of reciprocity. We must observe it implicitly if we hope to save the world from calamity. These Behavioral approaches really take two forms. They're regulatory approaches about shaping behavior, prohibiting behavior, and getting people who are currently active to change their warlike ways, and educational approaches, which look at creating new individuals who have that peace outlook, I guess is the way to say that. So the regulatory process gives you Projects like outlawry, the transnational governance movement that walks up to the United Nations, disarmament, uh, applying just war logics, where they try and argue that just war means almost no wars can occur. It's actually interestingly the opposite of what Rich was studying in, in his book, where he noticed that almost everyone uses just war terminology to justify whatever it is they want to do. Um, limiting executive power is another one, shaming and revulsion and attraction. The example I gave there was the um, Joan Baez and her sister's poster from the uh, it's 1971, girls say yes to boys who say no, where they're trying not to tell people war is bad, peace is good, but using either revulsion or attraction as a way of making that attachment more strong. There are also approaches that look at alternative and improved mechanisms, right? This is the practice end of what we do here at SCAR. Arbitration is the one that's by far the largest in that, but there are also a number of instances of promoting mediation, including actual mediations. Um, the cartoon in the bottom here is about the ABC mediation in 1914 that kept us out of war with Mexico. Um, and then there's also some that look at peace through terror. Uh, there's a crazy guy named Dr. J.H. McLean who wanted the United States to buy all his cool weapons because that would make war so terrible nobody would ever want to fight it again. And in the end, they didn't buy his weapons, but he got elected to Congress. So I'm not sure exactly what we learned from that. But there are a number of these approaches where once we view peacework as something beyond just pacifists saying no, 
you get instances where contributions are made that you may not otherwise expect. The other ones look at better functioning. That is, how do we make a better decision? How do we um, think about ideas more clearly? Irving Janis' work on groupthink is one of the ones that would come to there. The educational approaches are both formal and informal, in school and out of school. In school, you have people talking about replacing war content. You have new forms of teaching, what we now call uh, critical pedagogy, that undermine hierarchy and blind allegiance, anti-militarism, and also anti-patriotism work. Outside of school, interestingly, you get something called the International School of Peace, which was created to teach teachers to teach peace in 1903. You see campaigns against things like war toys. The first one of those I could find was in 1838, I believe. Yes, 1838, he wrote it down. You also see contributions about parenting for peace, how to raise your children in a peaceful way, and a number of attempts to teach through popular culture. And this functions differently than the problem of exposure because they're not just saying, hey, look, this is what's happening or this is what you should see, but they're showing somebody working through a learning process as they move. And the two examples I put um, really small on the bottom here are the Mr. Rogers conflict episodes um, from 1983 and also A Carol for Another Christmas, which is a Rod Serling TV movie from 1967, um, both of which have great stories behind them that I'm not allowed to tell because of time. The problem of action is the last one. And the problem of action just says what we need to do is stop this. It's, it's very straightforward. It's the most direct of the problems. And the interventions that come from it are both the ones that can cost the most, but also the ones that seem to have the best chance of an immediate reduction of, of success. Now, um, I took my title from a quote from Timothy Fuller, who was a congressman who was arguing on the floor of Congress about the Seminole Wars. This is in 1819, they had this big discussion and debrief about fighting the Seminole Wars. And he said, let us examine without fear any existing practice which militates against the rights of humanity, and whenever it shall be found substantially unnecessary, let us boldly explode it, and no doubt that our example will be approved and adopted by other nations. He doesn't believe we need to convince, we need to talk, we need to teach. He's saying you must act against these systems of injustice, these systems that are causing problems. Action doesn't fit as cleanly into categories the way some of the others do. And I think it's best to think about the interventions along the problems of action between, uh, as a continuum between politics and disruption. Some are very political in the sense that they operate within the established system. Some of them are very disruptive. Most of them fall somewhere in between. So more on the political end, you get things like demonstrations, right? Everyone says there's a war, we're gonna go throw a street demonstration. Occupation moves a little more towards disruption. We have a number of occupations, especially undertaken by women over the last 40 years. You also have the withdrawal of consent, where people say, I'm not going to help. All within the bounds of a, of a generally accepted civic attitude. Disruption is when you start moving along into this. So tax resistance, the first step, I won't pay my taxes because my taxes support war. Actually undermining the institution is when you get into things that become much more dangerous, blocking trains, keeping people from going to work, um, keeping uh, uh, boats from being loaded with ammunition. Um, and then you hit a really interesting one that I was uh, unsure what to do with, self-immolation. There are very few instances of self-immolation in American history as a political act. Um, we think 20, 25 that we can document, but 80% of those were people doing it specifically for peace reasons. And it seemed important for me to find a way to incorporate that in. And instead of choosing to make self-immolation an act ultimately of, of messaging and calling it exposure, I didn't feel that, that grabbed onto what it was. So for me, self-immolation was much more of an act of doing two things. The most important is it's, it's an entire refusal to participate in the war system. It's the, it's the removal of labor from that system, the removal of those resources, while at the same time also carrying a message and carrying a meaning. Um, there's some really interesting work on self-immolation, but, but I don't think it modifies what I'm talking about in the end. The final ones that we looked at were military resistance. These are people standing up to the military. Often this happened in schools, where they're trying to demilitarize schools. 
keep compulsory military training out, keep ROTC out. The School Peace League in the 30s was a huge organization that would do student strikes for peace. The largest one, which had more than, the largest one in 1936 had more than 500,000 participants. We also see draft resistance when there's been a draft that has been and sometimes very organized, sometimes less organized. Anti-enlistment work when the times that we didn't have a draft. And finally, GI peace work and GI resistance, which for me includes everything from an intentional slowdown or refusal to follow an order to somewhat controversially thinking about fragging as an act of peace work when it is done to keep the soldiers from going to fight. So looking at all that, I have a number of conclusions. Um, I think about it three different ways. The first is about the problem orientation approach. I think this approach functioned very well for this particular object. And I think it was a good way to provide some handholds on what otherwise is a very unwieldy thing to talk about. Also, I, I, much, I was very satisfied at the end when I realized this is what had happened that the focus on intervention, let me focus on the labor of peace work and get away from the tone and content of a lot of peace history and other writing, which tends to overemphasize the importance of particular individuals or limit itself to organizations and, and to an extent fetishize those particular people. Um, by looking at the labor, I was able to get a much broader view of what goes on, a much broader view of who can contribute, and a much broader view of the possibilities for what we see. And finally, returning to the rhizome, I found that the rhizomatic approach, I felt was a very comfortable approach for looking at this particular object, although I wouldn't necessarily uh, wish it upon anyone else. There are some questions, I think, worth asking in further work. One is whether this four-problem approach is actually useful in other forms of activism. Um, there have been instances from a conflict perspective when we think about social movements where movements have split and divided over intervention questions that could be framed this way. The one that comes to mind to me is the split between ACT UP and the Treatment Action Group during the AIDS crisis. Um, that was a fundamental dispute about how they should go about making change. I wonder if that might be a useful point to go on forward. Um, asking if the rhizomatic approach is appropriate, if it goes beyond what I'm doing here. And specifically, if we're going to think rhizomatically about our situation and think rhizomatically about our work, what does that mean for our practice? Which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, we definitely need more understanding about transformations of war systems. It's, it's an area that's very understudied when you're talking about countries like the United States, although we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to do it if it's somewhere else. And I was stunned by the amount of stuff that I found that nobody seems to talk about. There's, there's an immense rich history here that can be mined by a number of scholars. It's being done in peace history, but there's much more that can be done. So I kind of end by talking about American peace work praxis. And um, being a good SCAR student, I feel like I should end the book with a list of the, the 10 things you should do now to solve the problem. I don't have those. Uh, this isn't that kind of problem, I don't think. This isn't uh, that kind of solution. Um, that might be the next step. But I have a couple of, of oh, vague suggestions, I think is the way I want to talk about it. The first is that we want to stress the health of the rhizome. I say that carefully because I don't want to get too far into the biological metaphor. But the movement of, of ideas, of interventions within the rhizome, the growth, the connections, that we can foster a healthier environment in which people can do these things. I also feel that the rhizomatic approach allows you the possibility to adopt a non-conflictual frame to this. Most social movement presumes, most social movement activity presumes that you are the group that is up against the other dominant group. And the entire enterprise is structured as a conflict that you need to win. Right? And a number of people in our field have even talked about that um, for, to good effect, that sometimes we might want to be on the side of the small group and not in the middle, those kinds of things. But I think a rhizomatic approach allows you to adopt something like the notion of transformation and change in a way that doesn't necessarily require you to set up enemies. Now, there may be a way in which this could be true strategically and totally not true tactically. 
and maybe something that is great to explain to people, but not great to have them do. I really don't know, but there's, there's something interesting going on there. I also think this approach allows us to have less focus on control and coordination and therefore privileging particular types of actors. And, and finally, I, I ended on this idea that organizing and political action and getting people together is often almost, well, I think almost always a narrative act. You're telling stories for mobilization, for information, and if we're going to rethink piecework rhizomatically, we need to come up with a way to narrate that rhizome. And a traditional linear narrative doesn't do that. Um, I have no idea what this looks like. Um, I point out uh, the possibility, maybe in experimental fiction or something like that, but um, I really don't have an answer, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting question as we go forward. So that's it, and um, you can find me at my email address. This is when you clap, right? Uh, Derek, thank you very much, and now we'll, uh, we'll ask some questions. Um, and we will, uh, as is our custom, we'll start uh, with our colleague from uh, across town and, uh, and ask uh, Dr. Dale to open the question. All right. Well, Derek, I was very impressed reading this. Uh, I think it's, it's a book, really. <laughs> uh, it's in great shape. It was fun to read. I think you're, uh, not only is your writing wonderful and clear and, and has a, a fantastic tone, but your examples throughout continued to impress me. And the, the, the breadth and the, the diversity of sources uh, made me feel like uh, I had a guide here taking me through the history of American piecework who, who really knew what he was talking about. Um, and as I was, you know, trying to not just enjoy it, but also provide some, you know, meaningful feedback for you and try to think of uh, questions I have. You, one of the first places I start on a dissertation uh, is, is with methods and thinking, mm -hmm. of thinking through some of these questions. And I was thinking, man, how did Derek get all of these sources? Like, where is this just something he's sort of accumulated reading over time? It's like, that's, that's possible. At the same time, you know, I've got to ask, um, you know, how, how do you select these texts mm -hmm. that you find? What sort of, I mean, you've got all kinds of sources you've talked about, but was there any sort of uh, sampling that you can point to? Sure. How do you, sure. are you just cherry picking the ones that seem to fit or is there more of a method here to how you, you identify these, the sources from which you're drawing them? You, you pointed right. to some corpuses that were very mm -hmm. large, but how did you decide on which ones I to trace? There, there are two, two ways to look at that um, because we have the sources where I looked to formulate my ideas about what there was here and then there was where I went to find the best examples to make it clear in the writing. And so the second is definitely a cherry picking. Of all the stuff, I come across um, a weird article about uh, young communists beating up Boy Scouts. It makes me laugh a little bit. So it gets put in the pile of probably a useful thing to talk about. Um, in identifying the work, I feel that this is a project I probably couldn't have done 20 years ago. Um, I don't know if I could have done it 10 years ago because we've seen a huge growth in the access to this information. So we have, you know, starting off we have the Google Books corpus where they basically scan every public domain book they can find. We have um, Hathi Trust that does a lot of that, duplicates a lot of that work. You have Swarthmore's Peace Collection that's, that's more and more is coming online. Um, JSTOR worked with somebody to put the entire run of these old peace journals online that allow you then to identify those as well as allow me to do things like a, a larger search. So my question is, wait, I saw this here and then it came up again in the 1900s. I wonder if it happened earlier than that. I can go in and, and query those, those corpuses and find an example and get to, get to an, an article read the article, see if it seems to fit, right? And I'm very careful when I make those claims to say the earliest example I could find was this or that. But it, it really reinforced the repetition idea. So I did a lot of data collection, um, a lot of processing 
that probably wasn't close reading. <laughs> Um, that 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 it was it was working through. Now this looks good. Okay, it moves to another stack, which is something we're going to look at in more detail. This looks good, and the when the problem orientations popped out to me at, near the beginning of that process, it then gave me a frame on which to hang those. So I did let that drive some of the collection of material after that point, where where I could say I think this is an important part of it, but I don't have quite so much. So let's look more into ideas of knowledge or something like that. So is it fair to, to describe this process then, if I'm understanding mm -hmm. you correctly, say it, you begin by collecting broadly. At a certain point, you start to see certain problem orientations emerge, mm -hmm. yeah. four in particular. Right. And at what point did you decide four is enough? And maybe, is that even intended to be exhaustive? Are there only four problem orientations, would you say, after this? Or? I, I definitely wouldn't claim it's exhaustive. I would definitely say that I found very few cases that I had a hard time categorizing within those four. And it didn't seem that there were other possible ones that were being used. But I believe that there are a lot of other ways we could be looking at it. You know, social movement activity is, is, is a particular way of dealing with the world that has its own institutions and ways of doing things that I think have, in some sense, pushed people toward these orientations to the detriment of some others. Um, I don't know what that could be exactly, because um, I haven't really, I haven't, I haven't thought in a lot of detail. But um, I think this is a good idea of one way in which you could say this is a relatively complete map of piecework. But it's not the only map, and it's definitely not a complete map. Well, your claim, as I understand the dissertation, is not that it's a map of, of piecework in general, but of American piecework. Oh, sorry, of American yeah. piecework, right. And that this exactly. is a case study right. from which we might be able to generalize, but could at least uh, derive comparisons. For right, the exactly. Okay. So this leads me to another mm -hmm. methodological question, uh, or conceptual question mm -hmm. of conceptualization. With American piecework, as, as you are very mm -hmm. you know, clear in, in your dissertation, it's, it's a tricky boundary to mm -hmm. delineate. Uh, and one of the things I was, I was thinking about from, from my own work, it, you know, where that could mm -hmm. get, get tricky would be around the war on terror, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the, the first weeks when uh, the executive branch under George Bush mm -hmm. starts to work with 40 other countries around the world to set up uh, what becomes uh, the Extraordinary Rendition Program. But it's only the executive branch, mm -hmm. as unbeknownst to judiciary right. or uh, you know, parliamentary or legislative. So in, in that instance, is uh, you, you, you see some pushback after a while, an anti-torture mm -hmm. movement that's transnationally organized. Right. Uh, would this be, in your mind, something that could fall into the category of American piecework, even though it's not mm -hmm. just an American, it's a transnationally organized extraordinary rendition mm -hmm. project, even though the U.S. did play a pretty. I, I think I role. would, I would qualify that. I mean, in, in for that matter, you know, we start with the Iraq War protests, which were worldwide protests against an action the U.S. was leading, but the, the protests in Britain were equally against their own government in, in that sense. American peace work as a label is arbitrary. Right, that's in my mind a researcher's tool more than a claim about ontological reality. Um, I was saying I can't look at everything, so I'm gonna put up these walls here so I'm able to look at something. And I know on the edges there are a lot of cases that get complex. Um, that at one point I was thinking, do you only use instances where the work was done in the US? Well, then that cuts out any of the big conferences in Europe, it cuts out um, to a large extent, the, the transnational work that in the peace movement has been going on for 150 years. Um, and so I came up with a more of a feels like definition than a clean definition that says if they're generally targeting the US or if they're acting inside the US, it'll be in the pile. And I didn't find a lot of cases that made me worry about expanding that. But partially that was because it was a limiting definition because I grabbed a really big object to start with. Yeah, well, that's where I, so it has implications, I guess, for thinking of this as a case study, right. an American case study. So you've got uh, you know, a unit of analysis that mm -hmm. focuses on an intervention, 
Right. And, and you've got an object of analysis that focuses on the U.S. as a target of, of right. peacemaking, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Intentional peacemaking. Mm -hmm. so, so when you do come up with interventions that are transnationally organized and the target could be something that's also transnationally organized, right. it seems like that would be a very tricky case in a world where you might try to develop comparisons. I think right. it would be a different case to yeah. me. Okay. This is the way I would think about yeah. it is it would be a great question to ask, is it relevant to approach this if we then say we're only going to look at transnational mm -hmm. interventions or to try and replicate this approach in another country to see what happens. Um, but I think ultimately it was much more about limiting the scope of the project than than any claim about how the how the interventions could work okay. in the end. Yeah, I, I don't believe that this proves in any way that the solution is an American solution to an American problem as much as what do we find out when we look at it as an American problem. Okay. I think it, that's a reasonable way to explain it. And then one last, last question I have for you here is um, this rhizomatic. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was, you call it an analogy, I think, of the metaphor. Metaphor, sure. Yeah. sure. Uh, it, why, why couldn't we think of these four problem orientations as four trees rather than four areas that point to some rhizomatic activity? And, and by rhizomatic, mm -hmm. I would say that picture doesn't quite capture right. what they mean by it because that shows more connectedness between mm -hmm. the mushrooms or the right. fungus than rhizomatic supposed to imply, mm -hmm. right? Mold right. that grows up in different spaces is pretty rhizomatic right, right, right. because the idea is that those weren't diffused from one original source to right. others, that these happen to pop up in different places. Mm -hmm. Maybe the conditions are similar. Mm -hmm. We don't know, but it gives us something to explore. But we don't see a direct diffusion taking place from one source. And, and so I, I think it can be a very interesting mm -hmm. metaphor. But why did you, I mean, why decide that the rhizome is a better metaphor for getting at those four areas of piecework rather than just thinking of four different trees. And, and the reason I ask this is because mm -hmm. at the end, you find yourself in the final pages in your conclusion mm -hmm. uh, smacking your own hand when you, when you right. fall into right. this naturalistic. Into something you can uh, do, right. Yeah, around the rhizome. You say, I don't yeah. want to create this naturalistic fallacy all over again mm -hmm. or, or overplay right. my metaphor, yeah. right. which I think is uh, wise. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, but you could easily fall into that if you carry that rhizomatic uh, metaphor too far. So. And I guess you could do the same with trees, but it, it, it seems to skirt the question, uh, why not explore how those four are connected instead of just assuming that they're all disconnected? I mean, at I what point did you decide that was the way to go with it? The, the first, the, noticing the repetitions and the absences occurred first for me. And I realized that just say pasting together all the histories of all the organizations or all the people wasn't giving me the picture that I needed. That um, when I noticed the repetitions, my first thing was, oh, let's go back and see where this came from, right? Because I'm trained to think that way. If somebody has this idea now, well, there's probably a version of that 200 years ago, and I can like read all the books everybody read in between, and they're not there. So I was left with needing to explain that, that absence and was exposed to the rhizomatic approach around that time. The problem areas developed after I started thinking about it rhizomatically when I said to myself, I can't just say this is a big pile of stuff. You know, I need to find some ways in which there is an organization or there is, um, the, the, in my head, the metaphor was often a center of gravity where, where these interventions seemed attracted, um, but I thought that wasn't a great um, metaphor. I think we lost Sarah just oh. now. We did. And ultimately, I found that from my perspective, I didn't think I could describe. Is she still there? Okay. I just don't see her video, oh, I perfect. That's cool. Um, that what I was trying to describe didn't fit the tools we had for describing other aspects, and that I needed to make the commitment to doing it a little bit differently. The problem orientations are distinct in that. You could write a book that uses two or three approaches at once. But in my mind, those are different interventions that, that you can't make. We can't all be 
you know, natural mediators and just cut something down the middle and I think you and call it strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, that's one way of looking at it. And I found it more fruitful once I detached myself from the requirement of explaining cause and effect on the small scale that I could then talk about relationships in a way that I couldn't do through like network analysis, yeah. you know, where, the, where I have to draw the notes, where I have to make the connections. So um, it was that, that insight for me was what kind of gave me a way of thinking about how to conceptualize what I was looking at and then start thinking about how to turn it into something that I can communicate to others. So I, I can see that and I, and I see how it, you, <laughs> I mean, I, I think this works in terms of you know mm -hmm. the final product and reading it. So right. It's much more interesting this way to, to to go broad. But in terms of the, the conclusion there, where where you sort of you double down and say that you know well, let's let a thousand right. flowers bloom, and and it almost suggests that we we can't really bring we can't really analyze any relationship between these four anymore. That they just sort of go off and do their do their own thing, and probably we should just keep. Promoting that, in, in uh, a way. But and I'm, and and I think it's yeah. probably fine to promote those. <laughs> right. But but I wouldn't want to assume falsely. I mean, I guess we don't really have any evidence that you've shown us yet right. for why we couldn't take as the next step, uh, move towards trying to understand the connections between those four. I think um, a little better. I was reluctant to turn this into four subcases within the case mm -hmm. and then start pitting them against each other so that at the end it came out and we knew the problem of action was the way we had to go. Because I felt that ultimately we're looking at widespread societal transformation, changing how governments function, and that that process is, is first one that we don't have enough examples to really get a strong idea of what representative would be there. But also two, it's just one that's so complex that we're better off being prepared to think widely about it and diversely about it than to try and turn it into the TED Talk version that says, okay, everybody go out now and light yourselves on fire. I don't know. Um, that was not my conclusion. Do not light yourselves on fire. So can you then, as in summary, this is the last, mm -hmm. last point, can you clarify then what the answer to your original research question is? My original mm -hmm. research question, um, as far as what's limited American peace work, wasn't fully answered. Um, I believe the, well, in the 30 minute presentation, that's my research question. Yeah. In, in the dissertation, I think I move from that a little bit before I go, where I start saying, wait a minute, there are a lot of ways we could look at this. I want to see what I can learn if I just look at the work, right? And so the research question then becomes much more about what can we learn about the limitations of American peace peace work if we just look at the work. I think we can learn that there's a lot of repetition, that there's a lot of, there's on the positive side an immense amount of variety and a lot of work that gets done. And on the negative side, there's, the connections are not always strong on that. But I don't think that's a full answer to the more general question anyway. Um, there's, there's a subset that I know uh, you read in chapter five where I stumbled across an entirely different research question that was fascinating, yeah. but that I, that I couldn't drop everything for, where I started realizing that the amount of repression that had been aimed at American peace workers was much, much higher than I had been exposed to, and most people think about it because we often frame the people who are repressed as being repressed for other reasons, or we just forget that those original causes for things like the Logan Act and the Espionage Act, you know, was what pacifists in jail to keep people from intervening, mm -hmm. um, which, which to me felt kind of rhizomatic in approach, but I just had a stomp on it. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, what I would like a reader to take away from this is the ability to think about these situations differently because I do think the praxis will rely on that level of contingency, will rely on that level of being able to make the connections that can be made when they can be made and that it can't be proactively trained on a 10-point on plan. But that's a subtle point, which is what I'm, what I'm fighting with in the sixth chapter is that, great, but how do you hold a workshop on that? And I'm not sure there's a good answer to that for me right now, at least. Okay. Right. I, I think it's just a limitation of, of the process. Okay.
Okay. Thank you, John. Sarah. I'm trying to I'm trying to get out of the dark over here <laughs> and uh, keep myself plugged in. So, um, well, listen, listen. A of light for us, Sarah. <laughs> My goodness, yeah. it was a um, it was a real pleasure, Derek, to read. It was a tour de force, and um, as you mentioned in your presentation, it was uh, an exploration that I had never done myself, and I learned so much about um, the resonances, about the history, the examples were extremely interesting. And I came away with a much deeper respect for the peace work um, that's been done in the country. So um, it was itself an intervention for me. Good, good. The dissertation was. And I thought there, there's something about that. I'm going to make a, this point first, and it was really my last point. You don't mention that in the dissertation, that your work helping us categorize these, um, what for me are big um, narratives, right? These are big storylines, the different mm -hmm. problems. That'll be one of my comments in a minute. Um, but helping us understand these different storylines reduces my own anxiety. That's what happened for me reading it in terms of which one was the better one and what should we do? And I ended up more relaxed and as a, as a conflict resolution person feeling like, you know, um, there is a lot of interesting and different work that gets done. I, so I wanted to compliment you on that and talk about a little bit about maybe you could add something of your own experience, what this did for you. You had a similar. Sure. Uh, actually, I went through the exact process you're describing where yeah. for, for a certain amount of time, I imagined I was trying to figure out which approach would work best because that's, right. that's a real fallback conflict analysis and resolution way of writing a, a project. And I, when I'm, because I teach the social movements class for, for the School of Integrative Studies and we, we teach hands-on activism there. In that class, I'm a problem of action person. Like, right. stop talking about awareness, stop talking about this other stuff. And there was a point in the process where I basically, I guess, realized or made myself realize, it's, it's a little unclear who was the agent here, that that wasn't the right way to keep going ahead. That in a way, that false conflict that I was imagining got in the way of appreciating the work and imagining what, what the work could look like as it goes on. Um, you see this phenomenon too, if you read the peace history, people love to write peace history stories about peace organizations fighting. They just love it. The American Peace Society breaks up with a couple of other groups over the definition of what a opposition to war means and everyone runs and just looks at the conflict and says, oh, oh, the peace people are fighting again. It, and that after a while really turned me off because I said, well, you're not, engaging the, you're not engaging the interventions at all the way that they're intended. And so there is a way in which I'm early on was trying to say, what happens if I accept all of this at face value? What happens if I actually acknowledge these people are trying to do what they say they're trying to do instead of finding ways to ironically comment on it or cut it down and I think that that is an undercurrent that carries through. It comes up a little bit in chapter six where I, I, I bring it out a little more, but ultimately um, for me, it was a very different approach too. I, I, I started off as a problem of knowledge person saying, I'm gonna find that one really cool thing from 1814 that we can just do now that's going to work, right? Every, every scholar who's got a problem with libraries has that dream of that dusty book that has all the solutions and no copyright. Um, and and I, I definitely moved the same way I think that, that you're describing, you moved to the act being much more about appreciation than criticism while still being direct and critical. Okay, well that, you don't mention that in the last section. And okay, I, I don't. My comment to you is you maybe could integrate um, something about your experience and share with the reader because I had that experience as well. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Because the work is itself an intervention. Right. And you don't say that. Right. I do a little bit in chapter six, but I don't, I don't talk about it. I don't do anything that you're talking about right now. Yeah, <laughs> I just kind of say it's an intervention. Yeah, I, I totally understand. 
Okay. So um, now I wanted to sort of go in the direction of my esteemed colleague, uh, John Dale. Um, and it was, you know, I was so happy that he had exactly the same questions in exactly the same order I did. I have a couple more and I'll start with those. Um, uh, just minor point, but could mm -hmm. be significant. Do you know Richard Day's work? He's got, he wrote this paper from hegemony to affinity and he applies uh, the rhizomatic mm -hmm. metaphor to understand um, a model of social change processes. It's exactly what you're offering. And it may be useful for you to um, use that early on in the work mm -hmm. as, a, as a way of helping you frame the problem. Because sure. if you frame it as a rhizomatic problem, and not as, you know, as your research question, as right. a rhizomatic problem, instead of discovering the rhizomatic approach, and that's right. what you basically do. Right. You, you know, we have to accompany you, the dissertation student walking down the beach, seeing right. this beautiful rock and picking it up and saying, oh, I like this rock, and I'm pulling my hair out because <laughs> I don't want you to walk down the beach and find a rock that you happen to like. What about all the other rocks, right? right? So go, to go back to John's point about methodology, and I think that's why he was you know, pushing on that a little bit, it'd be really nice if you could have a, um, a critique of social change theory, mm -hmm. which right up in the beginning, and it wouldn't have to you know, be a separate chapter or anything, you could integrate it easily, I think. Right. It would, you could then stand on Day's work and, and others perhaps as well as providing the critique of traditional social change theory because mm -hmm. that's what you're trying to look at is right. how um, you know does this all add up into social change and i think day's work would would help you do that okay um, i'll definitely in take which a look. case in which case um derek you'd have rhizomatic theory up front right almost almost crowned as methodology almost right you know it becomes the framework within which you're going to look at mm -hmm. these inter. I don't know if you can see my arms waving. I can. You know, look at the all the resonances and repetitions that occur. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes an activity of describing this rhizomatic landscape, or the landscape as a rhizomatic right. phenomena, and and your four your four um, problem areas are basically emerge. There are mm. emergent categories, right? Right, right. Which I would be a little happier if the categories they were framed as were discursive in nature. Okay. And, the re and you don't have to please me, right? Because, no. <laughs> um, you know, I'm going to support you, period. This, I'm, we're talking scholar to scholar here mm -hmm. about, about, you know, the issue that I'm raising, which is that once you start with a rhizomatic metaphor, that which is rhizomatic is, is discourse, it's meaning, it's mm -hmm. narrative, it's symbol, it's all that stuff. It's not, um, you know, it's not DNA, it's not a bunch of other things, right? Right. It's meaning. So it, it would make sense then if rhizomatic is a, is a description of the, it, is a social change theory that you adopt, and mm -hmm. then you look at then the project is to describe that. It makes sense that that which you describe, which end up being the four problems, are themselves narratives or discourse. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? I think if, if the transition between dissertation and book involves a lot of rewriting of chapter one, I think along the lines you're saying that, that you're right, that I tried to give the, here's how I got to where I got, which is not necessarily as interesting a story but also was something I felt was a little bit part of the performance of the dissertation, or more importantly, part of the performance of the proposal. Um, I didn't revise my proposal into chapter one. I didn't do enough rebuilding in that to make it a new story. And I totally agree that, that it would go. And I think you're right. I want to go back a little bit to when you said that, that reframing the problem is a rhizomatic problem, because I think I need to think about what that means. But I think that's a very good path forward to say, um, you don't care why I'm asking this question necessarily. I'm just, it's a good question. And here's where, you know, here's what I'm building from that. 
I would disagree with that slightly. I think, I mean, I was hooked as a reader. I, I want to okay. know why the peace movement failed in 2003. You know, I was really interested. It's a different book. Read Fabio Rojas and Michael Heanley's Party in the Street. They nailed it, you know, right around the time I did my proposal. Well, fine, <laughs> but I'm, I, I can only speak to what I'm, you know, right. what I'm learning the way I'm learning it, and I've learned this from you. So I'm, I was hooked on the question, but uh, I ended up seeing the four problems as discursive phenomena. And that, that are part of or way of categorizing this rhizomatic landscape mm -hmm. as, in turn, a way of trying to understand social change in general, mm -hmm. which social change theories that, as you review them, and first I was wondering, why is all this literature on social mobilization in the front part, where mm -hmm. we actually, before we ever get to methodology, I see why you put it there, because it's a review of basically what you're trying to do is say, how do how could this change? What are some theories and ways of understanding this mm -hmm. that would help us understand how this could change or does change, or if it does? That would have been a much better way for me to put it, actually. Pardon me? That would have been a much better way for me to put it, yes. Well, anyway, <laughs> um, this is all, this, I'm, I'm, my basic question to you is, and again, it, for me, all this is about methodology because I get a bit nuts. Mm -hmm you know, walking down the beach after you, watching you pick up different rocks. I remember that lecture from class. Yeah. I so, believe daisies were the metaphor that you used. Right, whatever. Daisies yeah, in a field. Whatever. So so would you, do you agree, and I'm certainly not going to require you to agree to sign the dang thing. I'm just wondering, do you agree that these problems are discursive uh, phenomena? They are narrative trees or they're narrative... Uh, their narrative systems. I think um, I'm, I'm fine using the term discursive to the extent that what we're saying is there are different approaches to meaning in that. Yeah. And yeah, and yeah, yeah I, I don't think, I, I mean, there's a little bit of smoke and mirrors that happens in chapter one to get from I'm looking at interventions to the problem areas because as the researcher, I'm basically determining what I think the point of the intervention is. And, and I'm trying to read that meaning act that's going in that in some cases might not be the one that the author intentionally had, especially with the problem of exposure, right? You know, the, the author, so, so yeah, I, I definitely see that land as being, as being discursive land. What I don't know is how structured it is, and I'm interested in thinking about that more. Well, but but you tell us how structured it is. I mean, that's the great thing about the world. I'm just trying to get you to see what I think is a really good outcome, which is mm -hmm. we've got these four problem sets. These are basically discursive formations sure. within which there are particular peculiar things happening, mm -hmm. and you show us what they are. So I end up learning something about the landscape as a total that helps me, would help me navigate, would help me know where I am, would help me make sense. Okay. So you know, ends up being, anyway, that's, that's my, one of my core issues with the work was um, whether or not these are discursive in nature, and if so, then the project from a methodological perspective is some mapping of the terrain of meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's entirely accurate. It'd be really nice if you could say something like that, because you don't, you don't have any reference to that right. second order project. Okay, right, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. That, yeah. that it's something so I was conscious of doing, but once I got, you know, of course, and I wrote this rather linearly, once I got right. past chapter one, I went back and revised a couple of times, but not with that in mind, which I think oh. I could have set it up much better and explained okay. the nature. Okay, Yeah. so I have, other, I have one minor sure. issue, just a minor thing, why not, um, you know, I love this notion of resonance, and it's got a lot of uptake across, mm -hmm. and John knows this, across a lot of different communities, circles, uh, that are trying to understand meaning or narrative dynamics at the at global scale. And there, so it's an important word. Why isn't it in the title? I'm bad at titles. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's no reason I, I, it couldn't be. If yeah, there was yeah. a reason, 
or why it's not? Well, I, a title was something I tried not to let myself get hung up on. And so once I threw it down, that was basically it, except for about five minutes when I had something much more pretentious that Rich immediately said, stop. Um, I think you're right that, that resonances and repetition works. It's a pessimistic title the way it is now. And I don't think it's a pessimistic work. And I, I do agree, something like resonance or, I don't know, resonance might just be the best term, I think actually does describe it better. I mean, you mention it in the, in the uh, early on somewhere. I don't remember what, where okay. it is, what page it's on, but you mention it. Yeah, it, does, it does seem let us, let us uh, boldly explode it. That, that came from the action problem orientation, right. right? Right. So that's just folks on one, if we're going to call it this now, discourse or meta discourse. Right, exactly. And uh, so in a sense, you're, yes. you, it, it, suggest, it, it could suggest that, that you favored that one over the others. I think which, I actually did at the oh, point where yeah, I wrote it. I don't it. think yeah. you would say that now. Which right, is, okay. that's, not, that's not a fair, a fair description yeah. at this point. Right. And then repetitions, uh, you know, in the subtitle, I mean, the, the a quote is always a nice, yeah. you know, that's the anthropological uh, mm -hmm. game for in your main title. But the, the subtitle is going to speak to you know, the, the sco more scholarly piece of right. it, you know, and, and what you're emphasizing, the concept that you're introducing mm -hmm. to the literature. And repetitions doesn't capture the right. the concept so much, so that might be a place that might be yeah. a place thing. But what is the core contribution right. you're making here? Make sure that's in the title. Mm -hmm. uh, Definitely. Nice. Yeah. That's right. nice. Should we function as I your agents? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I'm just remembering the conversation that, that I had last time where they said, "You can't have the title on your book. No one's going to find it. It has to just be yeah, words I, people will search for." I know. <laughs> okay. So. Um, one last comment here, sure. and that is, um, I want to go back to John's comment about letting the thousand flowers bloom, you know? And what you do is you bring us back to a very um, watered down place with that, in my view. I got discouraged. No, I, I, think, I think you're right. Um, I was tired, and... No, no you don't have to justify well, no, no, it. No, 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 but, but I think you. at that point, I was having a hard time conceptualizing a contribution beyond an, an academic one, let's say. And I think there's a lot more I can, I can think about there that, that lets me point toward, especially even just coming back to resonance allows, it gives me a frame on which to build a positive outcome there. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think that's uh, bad writing on my part. No problem. Accurate so of my, my mindset when I wrote it, but I typed, the, I typed the footnote there and just figured I'd be told to take it out, and then nobody did, so it's still there. Yeah, okay. So those are my, that was my, those are my comments. I said, I said one thing about the thousand flowers blooming. I was surprised you didn't use a thousand plateaus there and come back to the rising. I thought about it, but I was tired. And I thought maybe that's what you were kind of trying <laughs> well, to imply. Well, like, a yeah. thousand mushrooms. Yeah. Well, right. Mushrooms, yeah, yeah. It came from yeah, book, yeah, a thousand it was, plateaus. But right. it was, I, I felt yeah. a little bit like I'd written myself into, into a corner in relationship to a conclusion, not, not analytically. And I did take the time, I don't think, to work my way out of it uh, in the version that you've seen. John Day, Richard Day would help you. Good, good, Richard I'll take a look. Well, thank you, Sarah. And, and um, after those questions, I'm left with practically nothing to, <laughs> to ask because I've asked similar questions, mm -hmm. um, or prepared similar questions, but in a different, with a little bit different slant. So I'll give you my sure. slant, sure. my di slightly different slant. Um, it goes back to the original research question, mm -hmm. right? Sources of the weakness of you know, basically the American peace work. Um, and what Sarah noticed, in fact, what both John and Sarah noticed and put in there in the way that they put, um, I noticed too as an emphasis on that the problem areas are for the most part you, one would just, I guess the, the, the right word is discursive, or internal if one adds the factor of, or th considers the factor of, a, of the kind of structural environment mm -hmm. um, 
So if you, I mean, if you ask the man in the street or the woman in the street, um, why do you think uh, the American peace movement has been so ineffective in stopping wars? <laughs> um, you know, one answer would be, well, the Roman peace movement wasn't too damn right, effective yeah, either. Yeah, who has been? Um, and that, I mean, look at, at the environment, the, the, especially with your introduction about how bellicose the country has been mm -hmm. for the past X number of years happens to coincide with the emergence of the American empire. Right. As a, right. you know, as a world force. So, I, and, and then I'm, which also made me think about, well, other, other aspects of the structural, including political environment, might include factors like um, the struggle to create a nation mm -hmm. out of very diverse uh, materials. Um, but that kind of nation might might produce a different kind of peace work mm -hmm. than a right. homogeneous right, definitely. Uh, nation. You know that sort of thing. So, uh, which only which makes me wonder. Uh, um, just when you dish this up, I mean, as a book, mm -hmm. um, e explaining, I mean, perhaps the, the emphasis on discourse it partly explains this, mm -hmm. but I mean, but re how are you going to recognize, recognizing that there are other factors to consider, but they're not, right, you're, but not yeah. you're not, you know, focusing on them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, I don't know, uh, but uh, it would have, but, you'd, I think at some point you have to do that. Right, right, right. I think I've just got a couple sentences where I basically just punt everything I'm not talking about and say, this is my dissertation, I'm going to do what I want, which isn't, um, isn't the way to go in the book. I think one thing working against that notion is I went in expecting to find that. I don't know if you remember, the original version of this project was I was going to look at piecework that occurred during a couple wars, before a couple wars, and after a couple wars, and, and see what the differences were in the different times. That, that was like the comparative project that we started with like 10 years ago, whatever it was. Um, when I got into the material, all I found was similarity. And I didn't find these divisions as much. So in a way, I'm a little surprised that we've had these huge monumental changes in the environment in which peace work has happened, but we haven't seen equivalent changes in the work. Right, that you can you can talk about moments of you know 1848 is a moment in the peace movement, um, probably yeah. 1892, definitely World War One. Right, everything changes for the movement after World War One. Right, they're 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 going against a government that is operating in the same you know with cultural warfare and all of that, and the Cold War creates an environment. I'm surprised that everyone kept trying the same things basically, but I don't have a place to point them to say, oh wait, this is what you forgot. Um, so it, it becomes unsatisfactory for me in the end, but I'm not sure, I have a hard time separating my rhetorical project of we should see all this is connected because it's a much healthier way to do peace work from the analytical how much of this is actually exactly the same or same enough that you can treat it that way. In the dissertation, I definitely slide toward the intervention end of that discussion, I think, where I'm painting a picture that hopefully has people coming out you know, with, with some changed perspective to the good. Um, and, right. But I'm not sure the balance right. works out well. All right, well, I, I understand that. Um, uh, and I mean, it raises another question. Well, two, uh, two, uh, two, uh, quick, two quick comments, one is, because of uh, because of the main focus of it, I found I, w I was I have to say I was a little uncomfortable with chapter five. The Simpl action. Yeah. No. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the repression. Oh, it was a added on. It was like grafted to chapter five. Yeah, because I mean I think what you're saying it is right, and, you know, is correct, but it's sort of I was asking myself, well, why did he pick that? But you know why? You could talk about other right. factors as well. All right, but that's a quibble. That's a quibble. Well, well, no, but I think I think you're right um, that it is. You know, at one point we had talked, and I was thinking about making that another chapter, and I had a hard part, hard time imagining the transition into it as a chapter. 
that didn't derail things, but I didn't want to give up the time I had spent thinking about it. Um, so I need to figure out either a way to integrate that better or just to say that's another project. Yeah. That, that might just be, that, that, that may take away from the argument I'm making right yeah. there. Well, well, I think it does. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, think if, so. if, if, if it looks like a tumor, I think it is a tumor. Well, the other question is, I mean, this is, I don't know if this is for the book or if it's, a, if, or if it's for another book, but they, what you said the, a little while ago when you mentioned, well, you raised the question, well, what would successful piecework look like? Mm -hmm. um, and then you held out, you sort of dangled the rhizome as a you know, possible inspiration or whatever. Right, yeah, I think inspiration is a good word. Inspiration for that. Um, and it makes me wonder if you started, if you sort of, if you sort of stated, if you stated, stated that as a, as a primary question, if you were, I'm starting a new something. Mm -hmm. And you said, okay, the question is, what will successful piecework look like? Um, I wonder how you'd answer that, because I think it might require it might require you to look at not at successful piecework, but at peace, right? Or or at least non-war mm -hmm. taking place, and then asking how did that happen? Mm -hmm. And if if it wasn't through the uh, what, what we define as piecework, right? Well, then how does it happen? Mm -hmm. I mean, right now you have this um, you know maniac in in office who does one one non-maniacal thing, right? Right. He's not going to war. And it, so is that in an, in, a, in an empire in its last stages, is that how successful peace work happens? Um, I forget which Roman empire, Roman emperor it was, decided that the Rhine would be the outer boundary of the, of, of the empire in Europe. Mm -hmm. And made a decision. We're not going. We're not ever going beyond the Rhine again. And they never did. Um, so, I'm just just right, well, it's thing. just I don't talking off the top of my head. But work by people in charge, right? A decision not to go to war made by a president, even outside. The president just woke up one morning and decided not to go to war. By my definitions, would be peace work, but doesn't feel like it should fit in because it's so central to the act of you know, the entity. Right, so, I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's yeah. a different, it's a different approach to perhaps a different. Right, well, question, I think there, there are two projects you're talking about. Thinking about what Praxis looks like under a rhizomatic American set of piecework is I don't have even a good inkling other than I started seeing resonances it, of it in the way I end up teaching like, well, I've been doing conflict theory for a couple of years for the undergraduate program. And I spend a lot of time in that class making sure the students don't think that the people who are telling them things are right. Like the work is half, stop believing everything you read. And in reality, it's going to be complex, it's going to be different, and what you need is, is flexibility, you need the ability to pull on what you need to pull from. And I feel like there's something of that in those, those forms of conflict resolution that are, I played with improvisational for a little while in my head before it didn't fit into the, the dissertation, uh -huh. that may give a way to, to put something on the rhizomatic work that is about taking the opportunities that are presented when they are presented, about being ready to do that. Um, but I think you're right, I think that works better as a very well thought out separate project than kind of tacked on as, hey, I did research and now I wanna make it relevant which is what it would, I think it would feel like. Okay, Derek, thank you. Um, and um, would anybody else like to ask a question? Any questions, Sophia? You almost stayed awake, that's so cool. <laughs> she only snored from the committee? Then, if we, then we will call this uh, part of the proceedings to a halt. Uh,